welcome our guests from Genesis as well. Good to see you men, you ladies. Good to see y'all. Thank you for being here. Bill, you guys do a great job. Uh, the Lord does a great job. Amen. Thank you all for what you're doing and what's going on up there. Um, I want to welcome our guest. I see some faces of some people I haven't seen in a while and hadn't seen before. And uh, so I want to welcome you here. And again, I want to invite you to come uh, to our Sunday school. You never know when you might find out what the longest road in the world is. So, um, so if you have your Bible, we're going to go to John chapter 14. And I'm going to, I started to put all my points in one message. I said, no, it'll be too hurried. So what I'm going to do is make this a multi uh, sermon series. I don't know exactly how long it'll be. We're going to start off with it this morning. We are going to read 31 verses. So if you have blood pressure problems or standing problems, hip problems, low sugar problems, hold on to the back of your chair. And if you need to sit down, sit down. But we're going to ask you to stand while we read the Word of God. John chapter 14. <clears throat> Reading, beginning with the first verse in the New King James Version. It says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, <clears throat> and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you <coughs> and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you a little while longer, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me. Because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, <clears throat> and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not as Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you heard is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. <clears throat> These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, <clears throat> neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said, I am going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. <clears throat> let's pray. 
Father, we just love you this morning because you first loved us. We thank you for the wonderful time of worship that we had this morning. We thank you for the time of study and discussion in your word that we had in Sunday school this morning. We thank you that even now, across the hallway, God, there, there's uh, the teaching of your word to all aged kids. And we're praying that, God, indeed, your promise about your word that would come true in their life and in our life. That, God, if we will listen, you will speak. And, God, if we will obey, you will manifest yourself to us. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. <clears throat> Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. Thank you so much. So, let's get the setting for this. <clears throat> the setting for this, for about four chapters, is Jesus speaking uh, to the disciples in the upper room. Judas is getting ready. If he hasn't already left, he's getting ready to exit. And Jesus is now going to do a teaching uh, about himself, about the Holy Spirit, about the last days, about what the disciples would face, and then he's going to give them their great commission. These are what you would call his private last words to the disciples. And it's important because the disciples, even up till this very point, they don't understand. Even to the point where Jesus got up from the grave, <clears throat> they didn't fully understand. Even until he ascended after his resurrection, they didn't understand. But when the Holy Spirit came, they understood. So he's giving them uh, a, a backdrop, if so to speak, about what's going to happen in their lives. Because up until this point, they've been walking with him, talking with him, ministering with him, watching him do miracles, participating in them. And they still did not understand that Jesus Christ came first and foremost, to be the spiritual king of a spiritual kingdom that would not be over the land of Israel, but would be in the hearts of Israel, in the hearts of the Gentiles, in the hearts of people. And while they thought and while we think that their enemy was Rome and that our enemy is our own government, Jesus came to reveal that our greatest enemy is neither. Our greatest enemy is Satan who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that physical death is not our problem. It's spiritual death that's the game changer. One is spiritual life is to be united with Christ forever and beginning on earth and extending into a greater experience in heaven. But eternal death is to be separated from God forever, both now and in eternity. And that Christ came to give them abundant life. But that abundant life was not Israel overthrowing Rome, but that abundant life was that they would have hope and joy and peace and love in their heart. And that they would have a purpose for their life. And they would have an eternal perspective on life. They didn't understand that. Uh, Paul is trying, I mean, Jesus is trying to help them understand that, that in a, just a few hours, their world is going to be turned upside down. And everything that they thought was going to happen is not going to happen. And the last thing that they thought would ever happen is absolutely going to happen. And that they're going to be left behind by Christ in a world that's troubled and growing more troubling. And yet, his exhortation to them and his exhortation to us in this even more troubled world now than it was in that day is this. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let your heart be afraid because things are going to change. You're going to witness, he's talking to them, that I'm going to be crucified. I'm going to die. And, and imagine that someone that you've hitched your star to, so to speak, and you've been living with and traveling with for three years, and you have in your mind that we're going to usher in, he's going to usher in a new kingdom that's going to look just like the kingdom did back when David was king. And Rome is going to get behind us, baby. And we're going to shake, rattle, and hum just like they used to in the Old Testament. And all of that gets thrown upside down. And, and, and then Jesus begins to talk to them about suffering. And he said, one of you is going to deny me, and all of you are going to stumble. And Peter says to him, I'm going to do anything and everything, Randy's paraphrased, that it takes to stay with you. I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. And Jesus said you'll do it three times before it gets daylight. And so all of this is inundating them and overwhelming them. And they still didn't get it. And Christians today don't get it. Because over in the book of Acts chapter 14, I didn't give it to you, Shannon, did I? I did? Okay, I didn't. I didn't think so. I just intended to read it. It says that when Paul went through and made disciples in Derby and Lystra and so forth, he came back and Acts 14, 22 said this. He was strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm getting ready to leave here. And if you think it's been troublesome up till now, you haven't seen anything yet. You're going to have probably the worst day of your life in about 24 hours. When, they, when you witness me being executed. And then when you see them bury me, you're going to have the worst day that you've ever had in your life. You're going to enter into that time, at that point in time, you're going to enter into troubled times. But I'm here to tell you that I've overcome the world. I'm here to tell you that you don't have to let your heart be troubled. When the news of the world reaches your ears, particularly in context that I am dead, don't think that I'm dead, I've just gone somewhere else. And when the news comes to your ears of the world that says he's buried and it's over with, you need to know something. It ain't over till I say it's over. And I'm coming back. And I want you to not let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. The word trouble... Or troubling means to agitate, to have inner turmoil. Watch this now. To be moved from mental calmness and stability. And when he tells them to not let their heart be troubled, he means the word heart there means the center of our spiritual life. It's our soul and our mind. So he's what he's saying is, is that when you hear of troubling news, when you see things happening all around you that are unexpected that are horrible, when you find yourself being persecuted and prosecuted and executed, you don't have to be moved off the center. You don't have to be moved off the center. When you get that bad x-ray, when you get that, when you get that summons to court, you know, because your spouse, when you get that bad news, when that cop comes to your door at 2 in the morning and you know your baby's still gone, when you get that, you don't have to be moved off center. You don't have to lose your peace. You don't have to lose your hope. You don't have to lose your joy. And you don't have to lose your faith. You can stay in the middle where I am because of these things that I'm getting ready to tell you right now. Don't let your heart be troubled. Don't let it be afraid. Number one, if you want to be able to have an untroubled heart, In troubled times, you need, and I need, and everyone needs to believe in the proper Jesus. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. There are other religions in the world that have Jesus as a main or semi-main character in their faith. But he's not the main character of their faith. He is an adjunct. He's an add-on. He's another person. He's a prophet. He's a priest. He's a teacher. He's a rabbi. He's a sage. He's a wise man. But his name is still Jesus, and they refer to him in the historical sense that he lived and died in biblical times. You and I need to make sure that we are not just deists, that we just believe in God. That's what Jesus said. You believe in God... Believe also in me. You see, everybody believes in God. You say, well, I know some people who don't believe in God. No, you've met some people that are trying to convince themselves they don't believe in God. Because if there was no God, there would be no need to believe in not a God. There would be no atheism if there was no God because there's no God to be atheistic about. The Bible says that God has put in every man's heart eternity, that he's left himself a witness in the world, that we know that there is a hereafter. Every, even lost people go to the graveyard and say of their own lost friends, he's gone to a better place. Why? Because they have a hope and a knowledge that uh, death of the body is not the end 
of the life of the person. We believe. I saw last night at the end of a show where a guy's dying, and he said, I hope you have a good story prepared to defend yourself. I hope you're going to be able to talk yourself out of this. He goes, I will. Meanwhile, you're going to be in hell. Now, both of those guys in that show, based on what was going on in the show, are probably lost. But one has an idea that the other one's going to hell. And we always have this idea that other people go to hell, but we don't go to hell. Bad people go to hell, but good people don't go to hell. And we're always of the good people. We're never of the bad people. But the gospel says that we're all bad people. There's nothing good, only God's good. And that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ, through Christ Jesus. And Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. I am not the prophet that, uh, that uh, Muhammad said that I am. And I am not the spirit brother of Satan like Joseph Smith and the Mormons say I am. I'm not some add-on. I'm not some addition. I'm not some angel. Uh, I wasn't married, as the Mormons say, to Mary and Martha. Y'all ever hear about that? Now listen, I'm telling you, I'm not picking on Mormons, but I'm picking on them. Because my kids ride past, my daughter lives in a neighborhood that's across the street from the church of Latter-day Saints, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Don't let that Jesus Christ part fool you. That whole religion didn't start till 1830. They're about 4,000 years too late to, get to, to undo what God had already started. God already had a plan. Jesus had already come and died and rose again, and the Holy Ghost had come before Joseph Smith ever knew what he, who he was. Did you know that the, the Mormons believe that you've already lived in another life and that this world is just for you to kind of get things back straight so that you can go to the other world and rule and reign? You go, that's crazy. Oh, yeah, it's crazy. But when you ride by that church, it says the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So go back to my point. We're riding down the road. I got my two kids in the back, and I say, you see that church right there? I pointed them out. He said, Pastor Reed, you shouldn't be so hard. Yeah, I'm going to be hard. You, Jesus, hey, listen, I, I, I started to preach on false prophets today and call names, but I'm saving that one. <laughs> you see, because Jason preached, Jason preached on Wednesday night. And he was preaching about Paul was warning Timothy about Hymenaeus and Philetus uh, having a message that was false and it was spreading like cancer. And I was sitting right there and it just came to me. I said, oh, he called them by name. And he said, hey, Paul, he said, I'm not just talking to you about false prophets. I'm talking about them two jaybirds right over there, Hymenaeus and Philetus. You need to put a wide circle around them. We're riding down the road and I said, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I said, kids, y'all see out that window right there? Yes, sir. I said, you see that church right there? Yes, sir. I said, don't you ever put your foot in that door. Don't you ever be deceived by what's on, written on the Word. I said, it's a, it's a cult. It was started by a man. It has another Bible. It was given to him by an angel. But my Bible tells me in Galatians chapter 1, can we put it up? Uh, verse 18, he said, but if we, even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul talking to the Corinthians, he said, if they preach to you another Jesus, save the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. You better make sure if you're going to walk with Jesus and if you're going to have victory in your heart in troubled times, you've got to hook your wagon to the right Jesus. You've got to have faith in the proper Jesus. This book right here says, don't you bring another book now, but this book right here says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then Jesus says of himself in verse 6, look over at verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I'm so tired of gullible Christians listening to this mess from Muslims, oh, you say, Pastor Randy, you, you're meddling. Yeah, I'm meddling because they're preaching another Jesus. That we're all worshiping the same God. That Allah is Yahweh, Jehovah God. No, he's not. Uh, we have witness here, and we have witness in John, that if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. As a matter of fact, down here, Jesus said that I and my Father are one. I am in my Father, and my Father is in me. And if you don't think that Jesus is God, is one with God the Father, and if you don't believe that God the Father is one with Jesus Christ, then you don't have either of them. you got to have the right one. You can't just say Jesus. Uh, there's people named Jesus. They, they call him Jesus. They call him Jesus. There was other people named Jesus in the Bible. But uh, this, is, this is the name. 
This is the name that will make heaven sit up. This is the name that will make people sit up. This is the name that will put hell on the road. And there is, the Bible said there is no other name under heaven given among men. You say, well, Pastor Andy, you just told us that there are many people that are named Jesus, many people that are named Jesus. But let me tell you something, baby. When you call on the name, you'll know it's the name because things will start moving and people will start changing. And you don't have to define it to the spirit forces. When you call on the name of Jesus, they know you ain't talking about Jesus down there playing baseball or Jesus over there uh, in, in uh, some other country. When you say the name of Jesus in the spirit realm, they said, oh, snap. they talking about that guy that got up. They're talking about the one that created everything. And I want you to know, I need you to know, I want my children to know that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus Christ, the God of the universe, the creator and the sustainer of all things, the one who is in the Father, and the Father is in Him. And if you've seen Him, you've seen the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And by the way, foretelling of another sermon, the one who also has and sends the Holy Ghost. The triune God. If you're going to have an untroubled heart in troubled times, you've got to believe in the proper Jesus. Number two, you've got to believe in the sovereign plan. Oh, God Almighty. We talked about this this morning in our Sunday school class right after we talked about the Highway Equator. (laughs) Sovereign plan of God. Look at what Jesus says. Verse 2, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place to you, I will come again. I go, I will come again. I go. Now, he's standing in front of them, but he said, I go, and I will come again. I go, and I will come again. Well, how you know you're going to go? Because I said I was going to go, because my father planned for me to go, and I'm going to go. Well, how you know you're coming again if you're going to go? Because my father planned from eternity that I'm coming again, and I do what my father says because my words are not mine. I speak what I hear my father say, and because I love my father, I, I obey his commands, and if he said I'm coming back, I'm coming back. I have a plan. You need to know that. When you wake up tomorrow, when I wake up tomorrow, when the disciples woke up and they said, Jesus Christ is dead, they needed to say, God has a plan. God has a plan. If I've heard Bruce Palmer say that, one time I've heard him say it 25 times, God has a plan. Because when we hear news like the disciples heard, When we wake up and our Messiah is not to be seen, when we've seen with our own eyes him slaughtered and put on a cross and murdered, and then we see him pulled down, wrapped in a, a shroud, and put in a tomb and sealed with a stone, when we know that everything in this world, when all the news and when all the reporters and when everything that I see and hear and process in my mind is it says says to me, it's over. Jesus said, remember this, I have a plan. I have a plan. Let's look at Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 and verse 35. Here we go. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven. Now, what does it mean at the end of the time? Oh, Nebuchadnezzar kind of got lifted up in pride. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar thought he was all that in a bag of chips. He started walking around and said, y'all see my kingdom that I built? Pretty snazzy, ain't it? That says a lot about me, because if this kingdom is really big and really nice and really powerful, then I am really big and I'm really nice and I'm really powerful. If you think that that this entire Babylonian kingdom is something, well, you're looking at the king, and I'm something. Well, God had him a little bait of that. Let me tell you something. God does have a line that he'll draw, and he'll get some little bait of stuff sometimes. And he just decided to send word to Nebuchadnezzar. Hey, Neb. A little bit, he, he gave him a statue, told him about the kingdoms that were coming, told him how he planned into it. And he said, oh, Neb, you, you, you fix and have a, uh, you're going to have a timeout session. I know some of you mamas and daddies have timeout for your kids. And you say, you're going to sit over there for five minutes. For misbehaving. We had timeout. 
It just didn't take my daddy five minutes to get his belt off. I had time out for about, oh, six or eight seconds. It's when that belt slid through them seven rings of them Levi's. And, uh, and then he began to administer the rod of correction uh, that Jesus spoke about in Proverbs. And so Nebuchadnezzar had him a timeout session where he began to eat grass like a, a donkey, a, a, a cow, chew the cud. His, his fingernails grew long. His hair grew down like a mane, and for seven years, he fed out in the pastures, lost his mind. Finally, he said when the time had come, uh, meaning that God gave him back his mind, he stood back up, and he gets some clarity about life. Y'all, know, y'all ever had them clear moments? You know, I remember Woody Sarton had a clear moment. He couldn't get his, uh, what was it, them ABCs? Woody couldn't get his ABCs right. And he kept getting notes sent home from school. So his daddy came in there and threw that book down on the table. I'm just telling you what Woody told me. And he took his belt off and he laid it on the table. He said, son, tomorrow you, when you go to school, you're going to know them ABCs. <laughs> and I said, how did it work out? Woody he said, I knew them ABCs the next morning. And sometimes you just have a moment of clarity, right? So, so Nebuchadnezzar has a moment of clarity. And he says, so I lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding. Now, this is a king who's ruling over the known earth at that time. This is the king that's over a kingdom of nations. My understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High, which meaning I'm not him anymore. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can restrain his hand. God has a plan. And the proudest, highest, most powerful king in the known earth at that time thought he was all that in a bag of chips, only to wake up seven years later and go, I need them. And then he goes on after this. I love this. He goes on after this, and he goes, I'm the king of Babylon, and I'm going to make a new rule. And here's the new rule. If anybody does not worship the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if anybody does not worship the God of Daniel, I'll burn his house to the ground. There's no other God under heaven who rules over the nations and gives them to who he chooses. That while we fret and get troubled because North Korea is doing this, and China's doing that, and Russia's doing this, and Ukraine's doing that, and and, and Sudan is doing this, and the United States is doing nothing because we're still sleeping in the basement. But my point is, is that while we think that no one's in control or that everybody's in control or that just certain bad people are in control, you need to understand this, that God has a plan and God is in control. And when the smoke clears and when, when, when Sunday comes, when Sunday comes, the one that you saw buried is going to be alive. The, the clothes that were wrapped around his body are going to lay limp and the stone will be rolled away. Everything that you went to bed thinking was reality has now been flipped. The script has been changed. And now I am alive as I said I was going to be. He told them beforehand, I'm doing this so that when you see it, you will believe. Guys, listen to me. I'm trying to remind myself. I'm trying to remind you, I want to remind my children that God has a plan. And when our plans, when your plans, when my plans, when the world's plans, when the United States plans, when Israel's plans, when Russia's plans, all go to hell in a handbasket. When it's all said and done and the smoke clears, one plan will have been completely fulfilled. Every I dotted, every T crossed exactly the way God said it was going to happen. God has a plan. You go, well, that's not real comforting to me right now, and I'll tell you why it's not. It's because your plan's still working. Let me tell you when you're going to really need to fall back on this in faith. When your plan goes to hell in a handbasket, you're going to need to know that God 
is still in control. When you are out of control, you need to be reminded that God is still in control. Amen. Amen. So in trouble sometimes, if you want to, all that dry preaching Larry talks about. In trouble sometimes, when you wake up and your life has just done a 180 and it looks like nothing is going your way, you need to believe in the proper Jesus. And you need to believe in a sovereign plan. Number three, you need to be ready for a prepared place. A prepared place. See, this earth is not your home. This earth is not my home. You know why it's getting uncomfortable to live here? Because we ain't supposed to be living here forever. And, and listen, you know, how, you know how baby eagles learn to fly? Their, their mamas push them out of the nest. Oh, that's a parenting tip. Oh, God. We need, to, we need to just stop right here and just let Pastor Jeff get up here and preach on this. The only way them chickens and birds, eagles, that's what it is. The only way those eagles learn how to fly is their mama goes, all right, boys, let's go get up to the edge of the nest. But, mama, we don't know how to fly. <laughs> you will in a minute. <laughs> Shoom. We don't know how to fly. Are you going to talk or move them wings? Just a little something to help us all. They ain't going to never learn how to do it for themselves until you make them do it. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In other words, everybody say, well, we need to teach them how to manage money in school. No, we need to teach them how to manage money at home. We need to teach them how to make money, quit handing them money. We need to teach them how to manage money, how to save a little, spend a little, invest a little. You go, well, I ain't got time for that. Well, you will when you bail them out. Amen. Praise the Lord. A prepared place. Look at what he said. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. Where is that? Where is that place? Well, he said it's in my Father's house. Well, where is the, the Father's house? Anybody want to take a stab at that without a verse? It's in heaven. It's in heaven. No one has come down from heaven except the Son of Man. Jesus said, I'm going back to where I came from. He's going back to heaven. His Father's house is in heaven. And we get this word mansions, and we have all these Southern gospel songs. I'm, over, I'm you know, just over the hilltop to my mansion. And, and, and we made songs like we have a mansion, and it's a very poor translation, and it makes an even poorer song because it's completely theologically, biblically, directly off base. The word mansion doesn't mean house. It means room. And what he's saying is, is where my father's house is, there's a lot of room. And there's a lot of room for you. And there's a lot of room for me. And he said, I'm going to prepare the place for you. You see, guys, when you leave here, uh, when, they, when they close the lid on your casket, you're not gone. You just moved from this place to another place. And the Bible says that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for you. And it follows the Jewish script. Remember uh, in the scriptures that there's first the physical and then the spiritual. Because the physical is a type and a shadow to bring, to cast the light onto the spiritual, which is the true, but is highlighted by the, the shadow. And the shadow and the, and the Hebrew tradition is being uh, talked about here all through the scriptures is the Jewish wedding. And in a Jewish wedding, uh, the father chooses a bride for his son. They still do that in the Middle East. You know that, right? In the old, people that live by the old ways. And, and the father would choose a bride for his son. And um, matter of fact, I know a, uh, there's a uh, Jiraj, who's an Indian. He's a, he's a church planter. He's been serving God for 40 years, planting churches in India. And uh, he said, I never met my wife till the day I, I married her. I've been together 30 years. It was an arranged wedding. They still do that. And so Jesus said, all that belong to my father, he'll give to me. And we are the bride of Christ. And, and God has given to Christ a bride. Now, in the Jewish wedding, after there was a covenant made, that is that the father chose the son, I mean chose the 
the bride, and then the, the bride and the, and the uh, bride-to-be and the groom-to-be, they pledged their life to one another. That's what happened to Mary and Joseph. When it says that Mary was betrothed to Joseph, it means that she had been pledged, that they had made a covenant. And it was as binding as the wedding itself. It was as binding as the marriage. That you had to seek a decree of divorce just for being engaged. We call it engagement. And, and once, the, once, the, once the, the covenant had been made, once the, the vows had been pledged to one another, it's then the son would pay a dowry, y'all heard that word? A dowry to the father of the bride to take possession of her. The Bible says we were bought with a price. What was the dowry that Christ paid for me and you? His blood, his life, that he poured out his life's blood for that. That he poured out his life's blood for that. And then once he paid the dowry to the father, which was the pledge... That what he had just purchased, he was going to return and get. He then went back to his father's house. And his father allowed him to build a honeymoon wedding suite on the house. The side of the house. It was the, called the bridal chambers. And, and he would build it and he would put his best effort into it because you never get a second chance to make a first impression. And he would work on it and embellish it and adorn it until his father says, It's ready. And then the father would tell the son, go get the bride. And he would go. And there would be this huge procession that all the friends of the bridegroom would come. And he would usually come at night to act like he was stealing her away. We'll talk about that in a minute. He was stealing her away. And they would blow a trumpet. And they would say, behold, the bridegroom cometh. And all of the virgins who are the handmaids and the bridesmaids of the... Y'all know where I'm going with this now. And, and Jesus had a parable about the, the virgins, right? About the bridesmaids. And they would jump up and they would trim their lamps. And, and the bride would always put on... She, listen, she didn't get dressed at the last minute. Because she never knew when the last minute was going to be. And she got dressed from the time that she was pledged. So that at any time, if her husband-to-be came and they shouted out in the night and they blew the trumpet, that she could stand up and she'd already be ready to go. And he said, you also, when you see these signs, be ready for your redemption draweth nigh. And he would make a place for her and he would take her back to his place. And I want you to know that uh, God has a place for us in heaven. And I didn't come here to give you a big exegesis about heaven, but I just want to give you two common sense things about heaven this morning to take with you about where it is. Let me tell you, point number one, it ain't here. There's this idea out there that the church is going to usher in heaven. Wrong. Church ain't going to usher in heaven. Heaven's going to usher in itself. Jesus Christ is coming back in his own will, in his own way, and in his own time. We're not, gonna, we're not dominion theologists that believe that the church is going to finally overcome the earth with good. The Bible says that Jesus said when, he, when the Son of Man returns, will he really find faith in the earth? Meaning that this world is growing more wicked and more dark. You can know it in your few short years that you've been on your, in this world. That this world is not getting better, it's getting darker. It's not getting more righteous, it's getting more wicked. And it's going to wax on and wax on and grow worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. We are not bringing the kingdom down. We're getting ready to fly out of here and meet the kingdom in the air. Aim to the men. And Jesus, and it's not here. Listen, and where we're going, where we are going, it's not Jesus coming to be with us. It's us going to be with Jesus. It's not in the midst of chaos. It's out of it. Where we're going, there's no dead folk, sick folk, wicked folk, lying folk, killing folk, queer folk, or woke folk. Where we're going, there ain't nobody but the righteous and the redeemed and the seraphim are flying around all over heaven going, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, worthy to receive honor and glory. People are throwing their crowns at the feet of Jesus. It's a 24-7 praise. It ain't about you. It ain't about your mama. It ain't about your daddy. Everybody says, well, I can't wait to get up there and see my mama and see my daddy. I can't either. But it ain't Jesus coming to your family reunion. It's your family going to the Jesus reunion. And we're all going to be up there as family. And we're going to be worshiping Jesus. 
When we get up there, it ain't going to be like, where's mama? When we get up there, it's going to be, where's Jesus? Because if mama's up here, that's where, if Jesus is up here, that's where mama is. Uh, where's daddy? Don't worry about daddy. You know, we had a song, and it says, you know, uh, there'll be Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but I want to see Jesus. He's the one that died for me. There's only one set of nail-scarred hands up there. My mama held me when I was born, but he held me when I was born again. Hallelujah. That's the one, and my mama will be there. If the, if the normal pattern of things follow, she'll be the next one to go. After that, it's a, it's a, it's a crap shoot. I don't know if it'll be me or my sisters or my brother, but here's what, we, here's what I know. I won't, have to have, I won't have to pin her down with a GPS. She's going to be seated at the right hand of God the Father at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him. If you can find Jesus, that's where you'll see mama. If you can find Jesus, that's where you see your baby. It's going to be at the feet of Jesus. And the fact that we're there will make all the make heaven heaven because he's the one that got us there. It's Christ-centered. The, everything is towards the throne. Everything is towards him who's sat, sitting on the throne. I see all of these things sometimes, and I understand it. It's, it's entertainment. It's lightheartedness. But Dale Earnhardt ain't driving no car in heaven. Your puppies are not there. I know that, that saddens you. But if you got puppies in Jesus, tell me which one you're going to be thinking about. There's no rainbows. It's not even about the angels. Nobody's up there pouring out the rain. And there's not everybody's family. There's just one family. The family of God. And that while you and I are friends today, we're also in the spirit, brothers and sisters, in the Lord. We have one Father, one Lord and one Savior, Jesus Christ. And so just kind of lay aside the silliness and, yeah, your mama, I don't want to dampen you. Know, yeah, mama and daddy's going to be there. But let me tell you something. God's going to do something so stupid. Oh, satable, satata. God's going to do something so supernatural. I know you can't get it. I know you don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't know how God's going to do it. But I know that many of us will have brothers and sisters, children, mamas and daddies who are not there. And you said, if, if they're not there, I, I won't be able to stand it. Oh, yes, you will. Because somehow, some way, this sovereign God, in a moment of time, somehow, some way, it's probably going to speak because that's how he always speaks. And he'd probably say something like this. Now listen to me. There is therefore now no more sadness. No more sorrow. No more sickness. No more pain. For the former things have passed away. Behold, I make all things new. And so for those who don't have your brother there or your sister there or your mama there or your granddaddy there, listen, the fact that they're not there is not going to diminish heaven one iota for you because God is going to renew your mind to the reality that's set before you, and that is Jesus Christ. And so some of you know right now that you have loved ones that are not there, friends that are not there, and it breaks your heart now, but this will be the only time your heart is broken. When you get there, it'll be over with. Everything will be new. And you and you talking about a miracle. You talking about a miracle. God's going to do that just for you. And God's going to do that just for me. And then lastly, we have a promised return. We have a promise return. Jesus said, I'm going, I'm going to fix a place up for you. And then you write this down, you put it in your little book. I'm coming back. And when he ascended into heaven in Acts chapter 1, and the disciples have tried to put together everything he just said for chapters, and they've seen him dead, they've seen him risen. They've eaten fish with him on the bank of the Sea of Galilee. He says, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high and then go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth just stay here boys until I send my 
comforter back, till I send my paracletos back, till I send the one that'll stick closer to you than a brother. And when I was over in Bethany and I wasn't with you in Jerusalem, that it doesn't matter where you go, I'll be with you now because the ghost is going with you wherever you go. And it says, and as he spoke these things, he ascended up. And Mark, I think, said in his gospel, it says, and while they were praising him, he was caught up out of sight into the clouds. And they were just standing there gazing at him and all of a sudden they didn't even realize it they just looked and there was an angel there and he said you men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into the heavens this same Jesus that you've seen ascend into heaven shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go he's gonna come back it's gonna be visible it's gonna be personal and his feet are gonna stand in the exact same place that he was standing when he left here he's coming back to the Mount of Olives and every eye shall see him and every tongue, every eye shall behold him, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. God Almighty's coming back. Yes. Now listen. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, I believe, I believe, is Jesus' teaching on the rapture. He brings it into clearer context through the writers of the epistles, particularly Paul. But notice here that Jesus said, I'm going back to prepare a what? A place. Where is the place? Heaven, where God the Father is. And he said, if I go to heaven and prepare a place for you, I'm coming again. Now, the word again is a verb that's in the present tense. It's a future event, but it's in present tense. You go, well, how do you have a future event in present tense? Well, you're already in the middle of that. And you go, well, what do you mean? Well, the scripture says that you're seated in, Ephesians says you're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. But I'm sitting here looking at you. Because it's called a future perfect tense, meaning that it's so sure to happen that God considers it already done. And therefore, when it does happen, it could be at any minute. So he makes it in the present tense so that he's coming. You say, when's he coming? He's coming. That means now. You go, well, he ain't here yet. Well, it ain't yet yet. <laughs> He's coming. And therefore, the rapture, being pre-tribulational, is the only stance in which Jesus can come at any minute. If you put the rapture and the taking away of the saints, and you put it at the middle of the tribulation, or before the wrath of God, or at the end of the tribulation. Once the tribulation starts, you can time that. I'm talking about with a watch on a calendar. Notice that he says, I'm going to prepare a place, and I'm going to come again. To do what? Read the words with me. To do what? To receive you to myself. That where I am, where's he going? That where I am, there you may be also. So we know that when Jesus Christ comes back to the earth, he's coming with his saints, and he's going to be on the earth. But when Jesus Christ comes in the rapture, <clears throat> he's coming for his saints. And he's not coming down to us. We're going up to him to receive you, to receive you, to myself. That means that we move spatially from here to here. That, that he moves us. That's where the word to be caught away. It means to be taken or snatched up by force. Jesus Christ is going to come down into the clouds. And he's going to snatch his bride out of the earth. And the first Thessalonians, if you'd put that one up for me. These are the parallel verses of John chapter 4. Uh, 14. Let's look at this. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Let me stop right there and give you the quick background on this in two minutes. Exegesis on this. The people who had come to faith in Thessalonica believed that Jesus could come at any moment. And the reason we know that is because they were worried and had a question. What about our friends and our family that got saved that are not here when Jesus comes back? If they've already died, Will they miss his coming? And this is the answer to the question. 
I do not want you to be ignorant. Ignorant is not stupid. Stupid means you know better and you do stupid anyway. Ignorant means you don't know better. Okay, so he's giving them some information that they have not learned yet. He's taught them. We have other scriptures to show that he's already taught it. They had the expectation of the imminent return of Christ at any moment. He said, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who have fallen asleep. Fall asleep is a euphemism. Jesse likes that word. It's a euphemism for death. And in the Bible, it's used only for the righteous dead. So he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of the believers who have died since you've last heard the gospel. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and we do, even so, God will bring with him, that's Jesus, those who sleep in Jesus. Well, if their bodies are in the ground dead, how's he going to bring them? Well, he's going to tell you. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. In other words, Paul's saying, now this is not something I made up. I'm telling you what God told me to write. That we who are alive and remain on this earth until the coming of the Lord will by no means proceed, that is, go in front of or before those who are asleep, that is, the righteous dead. For the Lord himself will descend. Jesus said, I go away. And if I go away, I will come again. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place. And if I go to prepare a place, I will come again to receive you to myself. That where, what? I am, there you will be also. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be, that word caught up means to be taken by force. The Latin translation of the word where the English translation is caught up, the Latin translation is raptier, which is where we get the word rapture. People say rapture ain't in the Bible. I said neither is air conditioning. All right? This is a mystery. This is something that's being disclosed and, and being brought to a greater understanding. We will be caught up together with them in the cl clouds. <laughs> to meet the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. air. We're going to meet the Lord in the air. Well, if he's coming down to earth to stay, why are we meeting the Lord in the air? I mean, if he's coming down here, why don't we got a pack? Y'all go, y'all see where I'm going? To meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. That where I am, there you may also. See how they parallel? Therefore, comfort. That's what he's doing right here in John 14, 1 through 4. He's comforting. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be a, afraid. Comfort one another with these words. So if you don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, if you believe that Jesus is going to come back at the end of the tribulation, let me comfort you with these words. If you happen to survive the famine, the death, the earthquakes, the pestilence, and not being beheaded, let me comfort you with the words. You'll see Jesus comes back. But let me let you also know that three-fourths of the world would be dead, so your chances of being alive are only like 25%, and your chances of seeing Jesus are even less. So let me comfort you with those words. Let me comfort you with these words, that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. 
so that when you wake up tomorrow and I wake up tomorrow and there's trouble on the earth, there's chaos and confusion, and your heart is wanting to be moved off center, and your mind and your sanity and your peace and your joy and your hope is wavering, and the world is trying to steal your faith, and nothing is coming up roses, and they're telling that Jesus is dead and God is dead, and it's religion is the opiate of the masses of weak people trying to compensate for difficult times in their life, you need to know this, that if you'll believe in the proper if you'll believe in the proper Christ, the one who lived and died and rose again for you, if you'll believe that I have a sovereign plan, if you believe that I have a place prepared for you, and if you believe that I promise I'm going to come get you, I promise I'm going to come get you, I promise I'm going to come get you, you will not have to go through troubled times with troubled hearts. Amen. Let me tell you something. Everything that he told those disciples came to pass. And everything that he's telling you and I will come to pass. And we have to fix our mind on Jesus and on his word. On his word. Let's stand to our feet.